Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Look at this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We, we read here in verse 1, it says, Paul an apostle, call, called an apostle, he says, by Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, my eyes haven't quite focused yet, go there, he says, by the will of God, now, this is one of the things Paul's intros to, I don't know, out of 12 of the epistles we have from him, some guys debate 13, they say he, he collaborated on Hebrews, but I mean, it's a pretty good amount. 12 out of 27 books of the New Testament go to this guy. But he got a lot of he headache. How, how come you get to be the apostle? Who, you know, who made you a guy that's speaking for, for God? And you know what he, his answer was? He didn't say, oh, um, this church organization over here gave me one certificate and now I'm, you know, a preacher. He said, the one who gave him the nod was who? God. He says right here, by the will of God, I was made an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, apostle means a one who is sent. Literally translated across, it is sent one. Who sent him? Jesus. Remember when he was out there killing the Christians? Had the letter from the, from the chief uh, leaders, uh, 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 scribes, and Pharisees, and they gave him the power and authority from them to go arrest anyone that belonged to this Christianity thing, this new movement, the way they called it. And he was getting them arrested and beaten and thrown in prison until the Lord went and gib slapped him, I call it, smacked him on the back of the head and said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? And he came back with, uh, Who art thou, Lord, that I might serve thee? And he said, I'm Jesus. And then he showed him what he was going to suffer for his namesake. And I know that in that three days, Jesus explained to him in depth the things of the cross. The things that Paul, even though he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he said it's a mystery, this mystery of salvation. It was right in front of him. It's funny how sometimes the truth is right in front of us and we can't see it until God illuminates our understanding. I mean, we, we can have it staring us right in the face and we're going, I don't get it. It's like calculus. You know, I, I know because I used to tutor people in calculus and they used to just look at me with that deer in the headlight look. Huh? You're like, don't you see the derivative goes with this? this way. I see a bunch of numbers on a page with a bunch of symbols. I don't know what it means. And, you know, you can have it right in front of you. It doesn't mean you get it. And, and Paul, he's like, I had the gospel. The mystery of salvation was right in front of me. But I didn't get it until Jesus came and he revealed himself to me. Then the light was turned on. Then the understanding came. And then his calling came from Jesus. Jesus showed him that he was the way and said, Now, Paul, you're going to no longer, you're not, no longer Saul. You guys know that in Hebrew that means desirable. It's the male, it's the handsome, like this guy over here. It's just, you know, like GQ, you know, it's the handsome guy. That's Saul. He says, no, 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 you're too full of yourself. We're going to call you Paul. In Hebrew, Paul means little. So we're changing your name from, you know, hot stuff to little one. <laughs> now I'm going to use you. We got you named right. And this guy who God called to be one that he sent, by his son, he said it was by God's will. Not by man's, because I don't think men would have ever come up with this idea. Take the guy who's the chief persecutor of the faith, the chief guy out getting Christians killed, and make him the preacher. You know, we usually think, we got one bad guy coming against the church. Kill him, you know. Bad enemy. Take him out, Lord. That, oh, well, that's my Sicilian upbringing coming out. That, that's what I think, you know. Some bad guy is doing something bad to us. Lord, just... Smear him off the face of the earth. That would be good. And I, that's my polite way of saying it too, but. But 
in the Lord, I, I realize God didn't do that with one of the worst enemies of the cross. He did something totally, I wouldn't even have thought of this. Instead of wiping the guy out, which would have been just like too easy, he says, I'm going to put him on our team. Not just on our team, but like one of the captains in the, on the game, you know? And I'm going to put him in the front of the line, and he's going to get a lot of beatings. I mean, he gave a lot of beatings, but he's going to get a lot of beatings. And do you guys know that, the, that in the book of Acts it records that the Lord actually told Paul, this is what you're going to suffer. Just going out the gate, you're, you, you persecuted the Christian, you're going to suffer. Now, I find it amazing. This guy didn't say, okay, forget it. Sounds too rough. He just knew going in, he's going to suffer. But he knew his calling was from God. It was God's will. Not his, not man's. It was God. And so then he writes to this church. He says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those that have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who are in every place that call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, we're all in the same family. He says, you guys, to you I'm writing, to the church of God. Now, he says very clearly, the, the church of God isn't a building. You see that right there? It doesn't say, to the church of Corinth, which is at such and such address. No, he says, to the church of God, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Saints, saint means believers, believers by calling. You know, the Bible says that unless God draws a man by his spirit, no man actually can be saved. It's not a work we did. It's a work he completed through his son. And he took care of, you know, calling us to him. And all we did was hear that call. Our spirit went, wow, someone's calling me. And you know the ironic thing is I, you never have to hard sell God's calling in someone's life because they know inside. They're like, I know God's trying to get me to straighten up. Why do they always tell me that anyway? Well, I think, Pastor, could I talk to you for a minute? i got a little problem. What's, what's the problem? Well, I know God doesn't want me to do this anymore. and I, I mean, I've been doing it for a long time. and I, I feel like he's telling me to stop doing that and start walking on the right path and and, you know, come follow him and, you know, just live like I'm supposed to. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I think I should probably do that, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's been really great talking to you, Pastor. I feel so much better. I think I'm going to go do it now. And then, what did I do, you know? I didn't really have to do nothing. Because the Spirit of God was calling them to do what he was telling them to do in the first. Sometimes all we have to do is have someone say, yep, good on you. Do it. You know, I mean, we, we short sell God if we think it's like up to us pastors to make people understand their calling. That's wrong. The one doing the calling is God. And it's by his spirit. And his spirit does a much better job than I could. Because if I was calling and you weren't answering, I'd be like, hey, wake up. You know, but the Lord, he's just like gentle with some people. Some people he's got to get a little bit, you know, rough with them, wake them up. Anyone besides me get a rough wake up call? I know, see, now all you ones have got a nice little, hello, this is the Lord. And you went, oh, God, nice to hear from you. You are blessed. Man, don't ever think that's bad. That means your heart is soft and good and, you know, praise the Lord. Some of us, you had to get rid of some rocks in the soil and some hard, you know, and some pull up some weeds and get the soil, you know, till it up and get the rototiller, you know, and grind that thing and flip it. In my heart, there was a lot of rock removal. There was a lot of sin that he had to work through. He had to get that out. And you know the nice thing about the Lord is he knew what I could handle. He, he, he was patient like a farmer. He just knew the right season to do every part. To, to just work with me and work that soil over so that his word could come into my heart and grow like a good seed and produce a good crop. But he's the one that did the work. He's been faithful from the beginning. And if we would just share with people how faithful God is. See, now, to the church that's in this really dark place, who are believers, Paul says, that are called by Christ Jesus. And he also said sanctified. 
Now, if you don't know what sanctified means, it's from the Greek. It's a, it's a Greek actual thing that we don't really use in our culture, but I'll try to explain it. In their culture, they had a polytheistic society, many gods. Poly is many. Theistic is theo is God. Many, they had many gods, belief in many gods. They had like Hermes, Zeus, Apollos, you know. You guys probably know more of the names than I do, but you, they had a bunch of them. And what they would do, if you had some wealth, you had your house there in Greece, you would, you would put the, you know, just picture in your mind one of those Grecian houses with the columns in the front, you know, those big pillars, and then you go into the foyer area, and there's some nice more big pillars and a big open area. That's like the reception area. And in, if you were really wealthy, you had a large reception area that you came into. And in the middle, in the prominent center back of the, of the, of the greeting area, was a pillar, what was called the pillar of sanctification. And it was a pillar, it wasn't a pillar to hold up anything of the house. It wasn't like a support column. But it looked like a support column in its fanciness. I mean, it was usually one of the most ornate pillars, carved beautifully, and it was basically a pedestal that was designed to sit to display something. Does anyone know what it displayed in the, in the Greek culture? What would they put on that pillar? So when you come in, the very first thing you see right on their pillar, oh, by the way, it was always at the height of a man's head. Okay, so just to let you know, it, it was about this high, the pillar, so that what was sitting on it would be right at eye level. You'd walk in as an adult and you'd know, oh, and you know what it was that was sitting on the pillar? It was whatever carving of whatever deity you esteemed to be your favorite God. So that if you came, you know, if you had Apollos, a bust of Apollos sitting there, Zeus, whatever you had, as soon as the people walked in, they saw who, which one you had, they knew. I mean, they knew your spiritual inclinations, so to speak. They knew who your, who your God that you felt. Now, it didn't mean you didn't believe there were, weren't other gods. It's just the one that you thought was the most important. The one that was most you identified with the one that you worshipped. You get to choose. Interesting. So Paul says that choosing this word, it's really interesting that he would choose this word, to those that have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Those that have been set up on this really special place, this pillar. Now this is the very same word Paul uses when he writes to the church at Ephesus. Those of you guys that are married, pay attention. Because it tells us in, in the book of Ephesians, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave his life for her, right? And he, and he says, and he goes on and he tells instructions to us men that we are to love like Jesus loved the church. And Christ sanctified the church and husbands, you have to sanctify your wives. You have to present her like Christ did. No spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing that she should be holy and blameless. You, when, when you guys talk about your wives, you better not be going, yeah, and she burnt my toast and she did this wrong and she's terrible. And That's not presenting her with no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. That's telling every crumb and bad thing. You don't do that. Because does Christ do that for us? Does Christ no. point to her? No. He, he takes our flaws and he washes them away. He cleanses us of them. And that's what husbands are to do for their wives. For those of you who don't know, my wife's perfect. I mean, for me. I am. But, but don't come asking me, tell me the dirt on your wife. I watched one guy do that to my grandfather. And I knew that he wasn't raised Italian for sure. Because, well, first of all, he's speaking English. And he came over to the house. We only spoke Italian until a guest came. So my grandparents switched to English. It was broken English, best they could. And, and this guy was there, and he was mocking his wife about how she had messed up. The, she popped the yolk of the egg. You know, then she burnt the toast. And, oh, his poor breakfast, his coffee wasn't too hot or too... I mean, it was like, what is this, the, three, the porridge thing, you know, too hot? Well, it, well, you're a whiner is what you are. But, but you don't whine about your wife ever the way I was brought up, Never. And you never do it in front of another person. Ever. Not to sit here and say all the best. How does that make the girl feel? Gals, help out. 
<laughs> I need two thumbs down. <laughs> that is the worst thing. You do not do that. This guy was going on about his wife, and my grandfather looked at him. Now, Sicilians are good at this. There's this, there's this look. It's like the death look, okay? I mean, if look could kill, this one is drop dead look, okay? He looked at that guy like, you don't deserve to be breathing air. Like, you know, you should not, that, that's just wrong. And I got to see the look. And, it, it, you know, as a young boy, that's a good thing to see. To see an older man taking a stand and saying, you don't do that. My grandfather put that guy in his place right then without saying a word. He just gave him the look like, not in my house. Because the guy says, so what'd your wife do wrong? You know, after he's given all the complaints of his wife, he segued right to, and what did your wife do? My grandfather looked at him like, drop dead. If you think I'm ever going to tell you, Mr. Blabbermouth, saying all this stuff, what your wife did, forget you. There is no, no way on this earth would he even consider to say something. Because love covers sin. Love makes that, that bride feel special. And the word sanctify, when Paul is saying, now you husbands, you have to sanctify your wife the way Christ sanctified the church. What do you say? It's interesting. Paul actually uses this very Greek word to take the bride and put her where? On that pedestal. But that pedestal has significance because that pedestal can only hold one statue. In their culture, you couldn't say, well, I'm into Hermes, but I also like, you know, Apollos and throw in Zeus too, you know. But let me, you know, crowd the little, <laughs> the little thing with a bunch of little statues. No, one, pick one. So when, I, I have this especially at this, for some reason, this generation, they don't understand that one of the worst things they can do is try to fit two, you know, like, um, they come to me, you know, I don't know what my, my, my new bride's problem is. You know, I've always been a mama's boy. I'm always going to love my mom. I'm always, you know, I tell her, you're both here. You're in my heart. You're on the same shelf. How do you girls feel about being on the same shelf with his mom? Is that a good, you know, it's a top shelf, but you're on the, no. Young man, there's only one, one that gets to sit on the sanctification pillar. And it should not be your mom if you're married has to be your wife. You'll always have honor for your parents. It's a command. Honor thy father and mother. But it isn't put mom above your spouse because that's your bride. And your bride goes on that one pillar above everyone else. Paul says that the church is the bride of Christ and Christ put his church on that pillar. We're, how special are we? I mean, he's telling them, okay, now they're in a dark place. But they, do they know the culture that, that when he says you are sanctified by Christ? Do they know this word? He's actually telling them a, a message that is really a great way to kick off. You know, he's got to talk about problems they have and stuff. But before he goes there, he tells them their position in Christ. And their position in Christ is a very special one. It's a very secure position. It's a very great place to be as a Christian to know Jesus says, you, you're right here on the top shelf of Jesus' heart. You are on the top. You know that he placed us there his, as his bride. Now, collectively, we're called the bride of Christ. So we are placed. That's a very special place to be. And Paul says to that church, to that church at Corinth, not a building, but the, the very people that have been sanctified, set apart by God or, or by Christ, and, and they are saints by calling. He says, which with all those who are in every place call on the name of the Lord. He says, he, he's, he's explaining to them theologically, you're not the only group of Christians. I'm writing to you guys, but with all those in every place that call on the name of the Lord. You know, I hate this about our Christian experience today that has become so fractioned 
into 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 different denominations and non-denominations and what group are you in are you in this group or are you in that group or well let me read you a little further in this chapter and i'm going to show you they had the same problem so paul he's trying to explain we're just all part of the bigger collective the bride of christ there's believers in every church don't think that they're not no we're, we have them all right we're the special group if anyone starts acting like we're the special group, we're the only group, if you ever start hearing talk like that, you're at a church, run. That's a cult. Okay, because we're not the only group of believers. God has his church throughout the whole of the world to be lights wherever he has placed us. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com Mahalo and God bless.